Okay, good evening to all of you. Welcome to our class today. Okay, so we pick from where we left on Monday and we did make an introduction, okay, uh, towards risk and return. Okay, that's what we did to introduce uh, on Monday on risk and return. <clears throat> Any serious? Okay, so the topic we're discussing is risk and return. Okay, was on risk and return. And we introduce that if, for example, you do, you would want to assess. Okay, the okay. So this is the topic. The top, the topic. Okay, is risk and return, or return and risk analysis. Okay, that's the topic. Okay. So we did say that in case example, you would want to make an estimation of the potential return that uh, you will be receiving as a holder, okay? Uh, of course, you may want to use example, okay? The forecasted, okay, returns, uh, or maybe the value of your asset uh, in future, okay? And so in case example, you are dealing with uh, an, equity, an, equity stock, an equity stock, okay? Uh, you will consider that the potential cash flow, the return you'll be receiving, that is the potential cash flow you'll be receiving, uh, will be in the form of the dividend, okay, you'll be getting, as well as the equity dividend, that equity share shall be paying within that time period, uh, where you don't assess the return of uh, uh, the, the stock, okay. okay. So a quick one, we did say, okay, that the return you'll be receiving, okay, that was gain equal to, okay, P1 uh, minus P0, okay, plus the dividend, okay, we divide by P naught, okay? Of course, we express this as a percent, okay? That is how we do estimate uh, the return that an equity share, for example, uh, shall be gaining, okay? So don't forget, essentially, this is a more as is a forecasting, okay? So therefore, the dividend, okay, as well as the P naught, okay? So this should not be the, this is not D naught, okay? Is a dividend, okay? Will be equal to is we are uncertain of the price we are uncertain, for example, uh, of uh, the potential dividend that we are getting paid in the next one financial year. Okay, so this is the estimate. Okay, we imply therefore the return you are receiving is also an estimate. The return you are receiving is also an estimate. Okay. <clears throat> If, for example, you are a debt holder, okay, in case you are a debt holder, of course, the return you will be receiving will be the potential interest, okay? This was the case of the equity share. But if you are a debt holder, okay, but if uh, you are a debt holder, okay, the potential return you will be receiving will be the interest, okay, that bond shall be paying you over the life, or over its life, okay, as well as any potential uh, capital gain you'll be receiving, okay, any potential capital gain you'll be receiving, okay? Okay, for the case of the, uh, the bond, okay, is simply what is giving the redemption value, okay? If the bond is redeemable, okay? Redemption value, okay? Let me just call it P1, okay? Of course, minus P0, okay? P1 minus P0, therefore, will give us, therefore, uh, the capital gain you'll be saving, okay? Or, of course, all over uh, the price, for example, you bought the product, okay? And that will give us, therefore, uh, the capital gain yield for that particular uh, bond, okay? Of course, over and above the interest you'll be getting, okay? And, of course, in case you do pay tax, okay? Net of the tax, okay? That is how you're getting uh, the return for the case of the bond holder, okay? Uh, in case you are present shareholder, okay, uh, the return you'll be receiving uh, is simply the preferred dividend which you'll be getting, okay? If it is not going to be, uh, this preference share is not redeemable, okay? If you consider that the preference share we are dealing with here, in this case, is not redeemable, there's the only time to be receiving, okay, uh, will be uh, the preferred dividend, okay? Will be the preferred dividend, okay? If it's taxable, okay, quite, we assume that it's not taxable, but if it's taxable, then of course we need to net off the tax you do pay on the preferred dividend uh, that the company do pay you. So the return will be seen will purely uh, be the, uh, uh, the dividends, okay? <clears throat> so simply for any asset, not just the two, have, uh, the three we have dealt here, okay? Equity share, uh, uh, debentures, or the, bo the bonds, okay? Uh, the private shares, any other assets, okay? That simply is how we determine uh, the return for that particular uh, uh, case, okay? Simply time determine, okay, what has been uh, the return over the life of this particular uh, stock, okay? What about the stock you're dealing with, okay? Uh, what's the price today, okay? What amount is the uh, investor buying the stock at, okay? Is there any 
in quotes gain or profit they have made over the life of the bond. Okay, of course there will be the capital gain component as well as you may want to say as whether uh, there is any potential interest the holder uh, shall be getting over the life of that bond. Okay. <clears throat> In case we are dealing with a portfolio, okay, now a group of assets, okay, so let me introduce here portfolio. Okay. Okay, portfolio return. We need to find that a portfolio essentially is a group of assets that we do view them as a single investment. Okay, so portfolio is a group of investment uh, where we do view that okay group okay as a group okay we don't go to the individual uh, assets okay we we more or less our main concentration is towards the group as opposed to the individual asset that do make that particular portfolio okay so a group of assets okay where we are going to view them okay as a single investment okay then we do uh, refer it as a portfolio okay now how do we get therefore the port return of that portfolio okay the first thing was to get to know uh, what return the individual asset contribute towards the portfolio. Okay, what is the return of the individual assets that do make that portfolio? Once you are able to, to identify and determine, okay, the total return that each of the assets do contribute towards the group, okay, do contribute towards uh, that portfolio. Okay, then from there we determine, okay. If we have, for example, a case where this portfolio, okay, or this uh, group of assets, okay, is made of two assets, okay, asset A and asset B, okay, we have two assets, we have two asset A, uh, we have asset B. Identify or determine, okay, what is the return you do get from asset A. Determine what return you get from asset B, okay, then weigh them, okay, just like the, 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 the case we did with, um, uh, with the cost of capital, okay, we need to weigh the return. We determine if the portfolio is made of two assets. We have A and we have B. Okay, from A we got ten percent. But what's the weight of A towards the entire group? Okay, how much investment have we made uh, towards asset A? Okay, as viewed as single investment. Okay, this this applies to B. Having identified and determined how much return you'll be getting from asset B. Okay then determine what is the total investment as a company we have made in asset B, okay? So simply the portfolio return is with the average return from the individual asset that do make that particular portfolio, okay? That simply is how we do get the return of a group asset or a portfolio, okay? Let me just write short notes, okay? <clears throat> you see the portfolio, okay? These are just short notes, okay? A portfolio is a group of assets, our assets, our assets is a group of assets or the asset is a group okay of assets okay is a group of assets okay that group of assets <clears throat> It is considered, all that are considered, it is considered a single set of investment, a single set of investment. Okay, that's what I mean by portfolio, a group asset that is considered on the single set of investment. Okay, so we do view them as a group, okay, not as a distinct uh, asset that do make that portfolio. Okay. Okay, you can see that they are considered as a set or as a group as opposed to as opposed to the single as opposed to single asset. investment analysis okay so when it comes to the analysis of the investment we do consider it as a set okay or as a group okay not as if you're doing a single asset investment analysis okay we do consider it as a group okay as opposed to a single asset analysis okay <clears throat> that's simply is what we do refer to as uh, an asset a portfolio okay and of course portfolio can have okay we just make that maybe a comment okay 
portfolio. You can have diverse type of assets, diverse type of assets, and the more diverse, more diverse the assets in the portfolio are, the assets in the portfolio are, the more risk diversification, okay, the more risk uh, diversification is achieved. Okay, I will still remember uh, the capital as a pricing model that we discussed together. Okay, on the capital as a pricing model we discussed together. Okay, where well, you see that one of the key assumptions of the CAPM okay, was the investor holds a well diversified portfolio. Okay, the investor do hold a well diversified portfolio. Okay, that's what the key assumption uh, that we did make when we were discussing on CAPM. Okay. So diversification, essentially, we've said that uh, the more diverse the assets are, okay, they are not similar, per se, okay? We have equity, we have bonds, we have premium share, uh, we have investment made in real estate, okay? One, the more diverse, okay, the assets that do make the portfolio, then the high chance you can be able to reduce, okay, the unsystematic risk, okay? I think we mentioned this uh, at a couple of okay? So the more diverse the assets are, okay, the more, uh, uh, and similar they are, okay, they have a chance that you can be able to uh, do away with the uh, most of the risk, the more diversification we shall be able to achieve uh, as investor, okay, the more diversification we shall be achieving, okay, that's on the portfolio, okay. On the minimum, of course, okay, on the minimum, of course, uh, we need to have at least two assets. There's no, you can have, uh, you can say that you have a portfolio in case you only have one asset, okay? Because you need to have, on the minimum, you need to have at least, at least uh, two uh, assets in the portfolio, at least, okay? The, ma the number, the maximum, it is unlimited, okay? You can have even 2,000, okay, assets in the portfolio, okay? But the minimum, you need to have at least two assets, okay? The minimum. Okay, the investor need to have the investor. <clears throat> okay, need to have at least two assets. Need to have okay at least two assets for the investment. To constitute okay the bare minimum. Constitute okay a portfolio. Okay, so on the bare minimum, okay, you need to have at least two assets. Okay, otherwise, in case you have one asset, okay, that's not a portfolio, okay, it's simply that asset, okay. So at least you need to have at least two assets in a portfolio, okay. The maximum, uh, there's no maximum as per se, okay, there's no maximum uh, as per se, okay. Now we go back to our question. Our question was determining, okay, this was our question. How do we get, therefore, the return of the portfolio, okay? We know how to get the return of the new asset, okay? In case it's an equity share, you know how to get the return of an equity share. Uh, if it is holder, you know how to get the return of the holder, okay? If it's a private share, you know how to get the private share. But now, how do we get the return of now the portfolio, okay, in this group of assets, okay? Let's begin, okay? Let's begin with, uh, okay, the return. Let me just make a mention. The return of portfolio, the return of a portfolio okay. is a weighted average. Okay, is a weighted average. We get average return of the assets that constitute of the assets that constitute that portfolio. The return of the portfolio is the average return of the assets that constitute that portfolio. Okay, what makes that portfolio A and B? Therefore, what is it with the average return of the A and B? Okay, so the sum give us therefore, uh, okay, the sum of the average. Let me just here, let's say A is the sum of weighted average return of the assets that constitute that portfolio. Okay, so the sum total, okay, of the weight of that return of that particular asset, uh, uh, weighted average return of the individual asset, okay, the sum total of all those returns, therefore give therefore the return of the portfolio, okay. 
and just make to make a note here okay to make a note here okay the weights generally not always the case okay generally the weight obtained is uh, obtained using the market value using obtained using uh, the market values using the market values okay of the assets is the market value of the assets that constitute that makes up the portfolio that makes up that portfolio okay so the way it is essentially uh, is the market value of those assets that makes up that portfolio okay if you to consider okay if we are to consider uh, the case of two asset portfolio okay so if you to consider a uh, case of two asset portfolio okay so case this is just case over two asset portfolio okay so a two asset portfolio <clears throat> So here we are simply uh, trying to there are two assets okay if you assume okay assuming that the portfolio okay assuming that the portfolio the portfolio we have here the two asset portfolio okay uh, is made up of asset a and called asset a okay and asset b so you have asset a and you have asset b okay and the return okay so a asset b so let me just draw a simple table here okay so this is the asset okay asset a and you have asset b okay these are the return expected okay from a uh assume it's expected a from b is return expected okay all the uncertain return from b okay and assume these are the market values assuming that these are uh, the market values let me just put the full names here this is expected return and here we have market values okay here you have the market values okay and the return for a if you're done return for b we have obtained it the market value of a let me just call it uh weight a okay the market value for b uh, is weight b okay so in case we do have that portfolio, okay, made of those uh, two assets, okay, made of those two assets, okay, asset A, asset B, and if they have their weight as weight A, weight B, then the return of this portfolio, we are saying the return of the portfolio is really average return from the individual, the individual assets that, that, that makes that portfolio, okay. If we are saying the return of this portfolio, okay, the return of the portfolio, okay, the, the, the return expected of the portfolio, okay will be equal to and the return of the asset that make the portfolio okay so therefore it's going to be the return of a we multiply by the weight of a okay i think i already mentioned that okay is a weighted average okay return of a weight of a plus the weight of b return x of b we multiply by the weight of b okay that's simply uh, how we get the term of the portfolio simply determining what the term what is the term of the individual asset that makes the portfolio what is the term of the individual assets that makes the portfolio okay we multiply by the weight of each of those assets that make the portfolio and we get a sum total of that weighted average okay and that's therefore will give us the term of our two assets portfolio okay as i mentioned conventionally when it comes to get the weights okay we normally use the market value of course you may have to consider uh, like in your exam okay what weight have you been given by examiner okay but conventionally therefore in case you can get the market values the better off to use the market values as opposed to using the quote book values okay and that's how you get the market value of a two asset portfolio okay the market value of a two asset portfolio now, okay how do you get paid okay maybe we can just expound on this formula okay and the same as okay return of a and multiply by the market value of a okay plus the return the return extent of b okay weight or uh, market value not wait now i want to use the values okay uh market value of b wait about market value times market value of b 
okay of course we divide by the total market value okay uh, can say market value a plus market value of b okay so the weight is the weight of uh, the weight of a okay weight of a here we have here okay or well, simply uh, the total market value of a plus total market value of b okay uh, plus we divide by the total market value of the two assets okay that's how the weight was obtained okay let me just here the weight here was obtained okay market value of a market value of a not b okay so right here is market value of a we divide by the market value of a plus the market value of b okay the weight of b here the same thing was applied was the market value of b we divide by the market value of a plus the market value of b okay so what are we going to use today it's about the weight okay and that's how we get to the market value of a two asset portfolio. That's how we get the market value of a two asset portfolio. Okay. If we have three asset portfolio, okay, if you have a portfolio made of three assets, okay, so we just add uh, the next asset in a portfolio. Okay. So in the case, this will make a mention. Okay. Case of three asset portfolio, case of three asset portfolio, three assets portfolio. Okay, we can say for the return, the return of the portfolio, okay, will be the return of asset A, okay, multiplied by the market value of asset A, in the portfolio, okay, plus uh, the return of asset B, okay, times the market value of asset B, plus, okay, return of asset C, we multiply by the market value of asset C. And of course, we divide by simply by the market value of all those three assets. Okay, so you divide here by the market value, okay, of asset A plus asset B plus asset C. Okay, in case you have four assets, you simply add the fourth term. Okay, and that's how we do get the market value, the return of a portfolio. We get the return of a portfolio. Okay, two asset portfolio, or the case of three asset portfolio. I hope it's very clear. The last time we met, okay, there's a question that we were discussing, okay, and the question that we were discussing, and I would want the part that we didn't do, okay, because we had not uh, uh, discussed this concept, okay, and the question was from June 2013, uh, question 3A, uh, okay, so June 2013, uh, question 3A, so go through it, we attend together, okay, June 2013, question 3 a. Okay, I hope you have, have uh, refreshed on what the question was requiring of you. Okay, so we did Roman 1, we did Roman 2. Okay, so now you're meant to do Roman 3. Roman 3 is asking us, okay, assuming an investor combines all the three shares, we have X, we have Y, uh, we have Z in a portfolio. Okay, now this is a group. Okay, um, in the ratio of 4 to 4 determine the return of the portfolio okay so this is a simply uh, a three asset portfolio okay this is the three asset portfolio case okay so here you can say this is june 2013 question three a roman three <clears throat> okay now this is a three asset portfolio therefore you can say uh, the return of the portfolio okay will be equal to the return okay of x multiplied by the weight of x okay plus the return okay of y uh, multiplied by the weight of y in the portfolio plus okay the return of z okay multiplied by the weight of z simple as that okay the three assets okay the return of x we have done this together already what was the return of x i can't remember we did this last week uh, on the on monday together what was the return of x, the return of y, and the return of z? We of course have done this already together. The relative return, not absolute, but relative return. We have, we have done this part already. So what was the return for x, for y, and for z? <clears throat> Mm, for X was 24.67%. Thank you. For Y, 
for Y it was 2.36% and for Z, and for Z it was 7.71%, okay? 27. For Z, it was how much? 7.7 or 77.14? 7 confirm, confirm. 7.71, okay, 7.71%, 7 okay. So we, have, we do have the term of the asset that makes a portfolio. We have X, we have Y, and we have Z, okay. And now we'll be given a weight. We told that for X, it is four, for Y, it is two, and for Z, it is four, okay. Because the sum total of those ratios given there, okay, of course, four plus two plus four uh, give us 10, okay. So the weight, okay, so the weight, <clears throat> the weight of X, the weight of Y, the weight of z okay okay for x it is four out of the ten okay so four out of ten of course we give us 0 0.4 okay uh two out of ten okay 0 0.2 okay and for z it's four out of ten okay 0 0.4 okay we have the weights now okay what do you mean what do you mean therefore the return of the portfolio okay the return of the portfolio will be equal to the return of x 24.67 percent okay we multiply by the weight 0 0.4 plus the return of y okay which is uh, 2.36 percent multiply by the weight of y which is 0 0.2 okay plus the return of z 7.71 percent multiply by the weight of z in the portfolio which is equal to 0 0.4 to give us how much with the term of the portfolio therefore. Okay, and uh, we give the term of the portfolio to be 13.42%, okay? And that simply is how we get the return of a portfolio, okay? That simply is how we get the return uh, of the portfolio, okay? Trying to determine, okay, uh, what assets make this portfolio? What assets makes up this portfolio, okay? After that, what return does each of the asset make? And what is the weight of that particular asset in the entire portfolio? Okay, simple as that. That's how we do get the return of a portfolio. Okay, the return of portfolio. Okay, hope it's clear uh, to all of you. <clears throat> okay, the next element we can discuss is on yeah, Louisa, Louisa, has, Louisa has a question. Okay. Yes, Louisa. Um, just for clarity, yes, it yes. means that when you say a relative return is when it's divided by the P notes and expressed as a percentage. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to understand the difference why oh, it's between relative. Absolute, okay, absolute. Yeah. Oh, okay. Essentially, don't forget to say that you can uh, maybe calculate, calculate the return, okay, uh, of an asset in two ways, either on absolute terms, okay, or in relative terms, okay. If you're going to use percentages, ratio, okay, uh, what else, fractions, okay, what are you going to be using? But essentially, it's a comparison, you're comparing, okay, not a, not a special comparison, okay. You, but using percentages and using ratios, okay, or even fractions, okay, then that is deemed to be a relative return assessment basis, okay. In case you're going to be getting the actual return in terms of the shillings, in terms of increment in the value of the holder, okay, how many shillings increase has it been, uh, what is the dividend, okay, what is the capital gain in the actual shillings, okay, then that is absolute measure of the return, okay. So generally, we do not use the absolute means, okay, generally, okay, we normally use relative measures of return, okay, of course, mostly the percentages, okay, like in this case we've done here, uh, we're using percentages, okay. Um, so it is is actual, okay, is actual in the units as they are, okay, in the units as they are, okay, in case they're in shillings, uh, in case they're in centimeters, in case they're in meters, that's what would be my absolute uh, measure, okay? Okay, thanks. It's, it's clear? Yes, it is. Ah, okay. okay. Okay, so that was on more or less uh, a bit of assessing uh, the return. What about the risk now? Okay, what about the risk? Okay, so measures of risk, okay. So the next is on the risk, risk analysis. <clears throat> when it comes to risk, okay, the first thing of course is for us to understand what is risk, okay. A risk, of course, 
it happens in case uh, what was expected is not what was actually maybe uh, received or maybe the, what that was what was actually seen was not what was anticipated okay that is what we mean uh, by risk okay that there's going to be a deviation okay uh, from the uh, the reality okay versus what the the holder okay or that particular person uh, was anticipating okay that's what we mean by risk okay the deviation of return, the deviation of return uh, from what was expected, okay, or from the mean, okay, that we mean by risk. Okay? That's the simplest uh, we are trying to define risk, okay, the deviation of uh, the return expected, okay, uh, the return from what was expected, okay, or the deviation of the return we have received, okay, from what this investor was anticipating to receive from that particular uh, assets, okay, that's simply what we refer to as uh, the risk. Don't forget the deviation can be in positive or in negative. Okay, as I say, if for example you are anticipating, okay, this investor was expecting to get ten percent, and he gets fifteen percent, that is still a risk. Okay, he got more than what he was anticipating. Okay, that's risk, but risk in good way. Okay, uh, if now the reverse occurring, okay, the investor was going to get ten percent, they get five percent. Now that's where the concern comes in because now it is eating on the in quote like the wealth or it is below what the investor was expecting. Okay, that is where now the risk come okay becomes more magnified. Okay, uh, but in case of the positive side, which is very good for the investor definitely. Okay, but either way, we quantify the risk both from uh, the positive side of it. Okay, if the mean the return is above the mean or if the return is below the mean. So you can have that simple definition, what is risk, okay? <clears throat> so in this case, the deviation, okay, we can find the risk as uh, the deviation, okay, of an asset term of the anticipated, okay, hold on. Okay, of the asset anticipated, okay, all of the expected, the expected returns, From the mean, from the actuals, from the mean term, or from the actual returns. Okay, that's simply what we refer to as the risk, the deviation of the assets uh, return that were expected uh, from the mean or from the actual return they be receiving. Okay, that is what we do refer to as the risk. Okay, deviation of uh, the returns from maybe what they were expecting. Okay, uh, or uh, the return, okay, uh, from the mean or from the actual returns, okay, that is what we simply imply by the risk, okay. <clears throat> okay, essentially, when it comes to the risk, okay, there are a number of ways that you can assess, or the number of ways you can use in assessing, okay, uh, the risk of an asset, okay, they're quite diverse, way, okay. Maybe the first one is, of course, the deviation, okay, uh, three range, okay, you can say the first one uh, is simply the ease of range, okay, or deviation, okay, okay, but then the measures of risk, okay, so we can begin from uh, the rudimentary ones, okay, and the first one is, okay, let me call it the range, okay, Okay, on all the range, okay, essentially is the difference between two two figures, okay. Let's say that this is this is the difference range or deviation, okay. Maybe um, I call this deviation. Range or deviation, okay. This is the difference, okay, between okay, two values. Okay, for example, okay. A G in case we have the return okay for A, this is what was uh, received minus what was anticipated okay of A okay now this is simply is a range this is a deviation okay uh, the return of A what was actually received okay minus the return of A what was anticipated okay this is what uh, we can refer to as the deviation okay the simplest way of trying to assess the risk okay <clears throat> then we can have B okay. Okay, so we can have B. Okay, so that was on the measure one, the first is to measure of risk. Okay, uh, then we can also have, let me want to use B. Okay, uh, the use of variance. 
the use of variance as a measure of risk, okay? Now, what's variance, okay? So, variance is the deviation you've just obtained here, okay? Now, the sum of deviation squared, the sum of deviation squared is what we refer to as the variance, okay? Keep on that. That's how simply we define the variance, okay? Okay, the variance is the sum of deviation squared, deviation squared, deviations squared, okay? By that we mean that the variance, okay, uh, represented by theta, okay, is equal to the deviation you obtain above there, for example, okay, the sum of deviation, okay, deviation we have obtained was A minus what we are anticipating, okay, we square those deviation, okay, from the first observation all the way to the nth observation, okay, from the first observation all the way to the nth observation. That's simply is how we can define, okay, uh, what we mean by uh, the, can define what we mean by uh, the deviation, by variance, okay. Okay, for the sake of a model, okay, so let's go to the previous screen. I hope this is what you mean. A model. <clears throat> Okay, let's proceed. Okay, and that's how we do get the variance, okay? It's simply the sum of deviation, okay? Uh, deviation squared, okay? So the sum of deviation squared uh, give us what is referred to as the variance, okay? Conventionally, okay, uh, the data you'll be having, okay? The data you'll be having, okay? Might either be a sample or might be a population, okay? Might either be a sample or might be a population, okay? I think it's much better. Let me just remove this, okay? The N, okay? Just to me like that. If the set of data you're analyzing, okay, is a sample, okay, so just if it is a sample, okay, that is, there's a set of data that you obtain from a population, okay, if the sample, then of course the variance, okay, the variance, okay, I'll be able to, the sum of deviation, okay, from the first uh, outcome, or the to the end outcome, okay, deviation squared, and said A, squared okay so since this is a sample then of course we divide by n minus one okay we divide by n minus one okay where just to define these terms here okay where this is the variance <coughs> okay r a is let me just call it actual return of a actual return of a uh, this is either the mean or the mean return of A, what else? And of course, N is the number of data set observation, the number of observations you are analyzing. How many data set are you analyzing, okay? Yeah, okay, and that's how we get the variance in case the data set we are analyzing uh, is a sample, okay? If the data set is a sample, okay? What if the data we are analyzing, what if the data we are uh, analyzing is a population, not a sample, but a population, okay? How do we determine, therefore, uh, what ought to be the variance of that data set, okay? So if it is a sample, okay, if, if it's a population, okay, so if the data set is a population, then the variance, okay, of our data set will be equal to the sum of deviation, okay, from the first outcome to the end outcome, okay. Uh, deviation is that, we square it, okay, but this is a population, so we so simply divide it by n, okay. So if the population, we simply divide by n, okay. And that's how we do get the uh, variance, okay, if our data set is population, if the data set is a population. Okay. okay, I've just remembered there's a, a, a concept, a return concept we ought to have uh, discussed before we came to introduce on risk, okay? 
but okay, pardon me, I introduce it here. Okay, what returns? Okay, so this is a return for okay, in the case I'll just say this from probability distribution, from probability distribution. Okay, it, it ought to have been part of the return. Okay. What we mean by that is essentially, okay, is that we are anticipating, okay, that uh, the following are the potential return they can see. Okay, let me just give through an example to make it easy to understand. Okay, okay, so EG, okay, so this is just an example to make it easy to understand. The following, okay, so okay, uh, the following. Okay, are uh, the expected, okay, are uh, the expected return, expected returns of asset A, the following expected return of asset A, okay, for the next one financial year, for the next one year, okay, and the return can get just yes, follow. So, the return you can get, you can get 10%, you can get 20%, you can get, let's say, 15%, okay? But what are the chance of getting the 10% return, okay? So this can have here probability. Okay, the chance of getting 10%, okay, the chance that in the next one financial year, uh, we are going to get 10%, assume it is, assume it is 60%, Okay, the chance of getting 20% is 10%, and the chance of getting 50% is 30%, okay? So the outcomes are based on the probability, okay? Uh, the chances, okay? We can get, the, it's more than one set of outcome, okay? You can get more than one set of outcome. And the outcome here is 10, 20, and 15, okay? All well, the chance of getting the first outcome, 60. Second outcome, 10, and the third outcome to be 30. Okay. If that was the case, okay, where the outcome we have more than one set of possible outcome, probability distribution, okay, the return of A, okay, a return of this particular asset, therefore you can say, okay, the return uh, or the mean return, okay, of A, therefore is, is given us, okay, uh, the return, the first outcome you can get, okay, 10%, the chance of that outcome is 60, okay. And the return you can get, okay, the next outcome, okay, is 20%, okay, or the chance, it's 10%, okay, the next outcome you can get is 15%, okay, uh, the chance of it is 30%, and that is how all that comes for the mean return, okay, that we are anticipating uh, to get from that particular stock, okay. There are three outcomes, you can get 10, you can get 20, you can get 15, but the outcomes, okay, the chance of getting each one of them is different from each other, okay. For 10 is 60, 20 is 10, and for 15 it's 30, okay? Now, if that's the case, what is the mean return, okay, of A? What is the mean return of A, okay? Okay, and you get 12.5%, okay? You get 12.5% uh, to be the main return of A, okay? If the data set, uh, or in case we have more than one set of uh, possible outcome, okay? Now, okay, so Stacy was asking a question, okay, on whether, uh, in case, in the case of an exam, okay, uh, do we know whether the data set, okay, is a population, okay, because as you can see, the formulas are different, okay? If it's a population, then they divide by n minus one. If it's a sample, if it's a sample, n minus one. If population, we are divided by n. How do you know whether this is a population or this is a sample? And maybe the exam, the examiner won't tell you. Okay. Generally, conventionally, we do assume that in finance, okay, the data set you're going to be analyzing, okay, is going to be from a sample, unless otherwise told, okay, unless otherwise we've been told that this set of data is a sample, is a population, then always assume that it is a sample. That is that's that's conventionally how we do assume things. Okay, okay, I think we can put that as a note. Okay, generally, unless otherwise informed. Okay, unless otherwise informed. Okay, the 
financial data sets are assumed financial data set are assumed to be sample to be from a sample okay thank you states for that okay so generally we assume that the data set is from a sample unless we be told that this is a population okay now going back to our um, assessment of uh, of variance okay okay uh, we did make a small deviation here okay because we are not uh, discussed this concept okay we just in conclusion before the return if you want to assess the return uh, from data you obtain from public distribution okay so in conclusion okay uh, we can say <clears throat> that the return okay the return of asset a okay is equal to the sum total okay is equal to the sum uh, from the first outcome probability okay is equal to probability we multiply by the outcome okay the outcome of the first data set we call it of i probability of i multiply the return of the particular probability okay from the first data set one all the way to the nth data set okay so probability times return okay from the first data set all the way to the last data set okay just like what you've done here okay this was the probability multiply by the return okay probability times return probability times return then you add the sum total okay we add from the first out data one two three all the way to the last data set okay <clears throat> that's how we do get the return uh, if the data is from probability distribution we have more than one set of possible outcome uh, for example to happen in the next one financial year okay now going back to our risk mission okay we are discussing okay uh, how we get the variance okay we are discussing on how we do get the variance okay and said if you're going to have from population from a sample okay this is how we get it from a sample this is how we get it what if now this data set okay what if now this data set is from a probability distribution okay how do you there for the variance okay okay don't forget this was a deviation okay so this was uh deviation because we didn't discuss it okay uh, in the other bit of bit by part okay so in case we are trying to assess or you're trying to assess the uh, variance okay from data set that is from probability distribution okay probability distribution then the variance okay the variance of the data set okay will be equal to the sum of the probability okay uh, we'll multiply by now the deviation okay of the first okay let me just call it i <coughs> deviation you've just obtained okay deviation of a okay i i minus the mean okay uh, of i okay squared okay multiplied by the probability okay deviation squared times probability okay we get from the first data set okay i is equal to one all the way to the nth data set and that's how we do get therefore uh, the variance okay if the data set is from uh, probability distribution okay variance in case the data set is from probability distribution okay deviation squared times the probability okay what the chance that uh, we shall have that deviation so multiply the division times probability uh we get a sum from the first data set all the way to the n data set okay now here don't forget don't divide by n or n minus one okay because this is a data set already uh we have one so if you divide this by one to mean as it is okay why do you have one here well the sum of probability don't forget always add to 100 percent okay so you don't need to divide okay and that's how we do get the variance that's how we do get the variance okay as one of the uh, measure of risk i hope it's all clear okay <clears throat> How we know that, okay, our next measure of risk, okay, so the first one we have discussed that you can use a variance, okay, now we can also use called the use of standard deviation, okay, we can also use what we refer to as the standard deviation, okay, so next, uh, let's discuss part C, okay, on the standard deviation, okay, standard deviation, <clears throat> so we can call this C, 
okay, the use of standard deviation. And what's standard deviation? Okay, standard deviation simply is how many, okay, whatever in case they're units or in case they're percentages, okay, how many units is the return going to be from the mean? Okay, so conventionally or generally, from this set of uh, data we have, okay, normally, okay, how will the return, how will the actual return uh, be from the mean? Okay, if for example, okay, the standard deviation is uh, 2%, okay. The intermediate therefore, okay, the return of this particular stock can be plus or minus two percent at any time point. Okay, that's what standard deviation imply. Okay, if the standard deviation is let's say ten, okay, at the ten centimeter, okay, whatever, don't forget, there's no unit here. Okay, it can percent can be uh, whatever, whatever units they are. Okay, if there's about the distance, okay, and you get the standard deviation of the distance to be let's say ten meters, okay. They can be therefore, okay, at any point in time, okay, that particular person, that particular, the, the point will be uh, 10 meter plus or minus where the mean is at, okay, from where the mean is at, okay, that will be the standard deviation, okay. Now, in terms of statistics, okay, how do we therefore uh, get the standard deviation? And standard deviation is simply the square root of the variance, okay, so simply define as the square root of deviation squared, okay. <coughs> Standard deviation, okay, is uh, square root of the variance, okay, square root of the variance, okay, simply the square root of the variance, okay, so mathematically, it's simply uh, the square root of the variance, okay, of the variance, you see it, okay, I don't know whether you did find for the variance, don't forget you did say that it is sum of deviation squared. Okay, the sum of uh, deviation squared. Now the square root of the sum of those deviations squared, okay, is only referred to as the standard deviation, okay. And as just mentioned, and for example, you do get the standard deviation of the return of a given stock, okay, for example, to be 10%. What does 10% mean? It means, therefore, that generally you'll be getting return 10% plus or minus what you are anticipating or what was more or less what you, are, you, you thought you'd be getting, okay. That's what 10% mean. What do you mean, therefore, in case we had, we did, okay, no, we have the, the standard deviation, we are going to derive it from the variance, okay, you're going to derive it from the variance, okay. So what do you mean, therefore, the standard deviation, okay, will be equal to, it says the square root of the variance, okay, and the square root of uh, the variance. <clears throat> what do you mean, therefore, it will be equal to the square root, okay, of the sum of deviation squared, okay, I, I, deviation squared, okay, the square root of uh, the deviation squared. If, therefore, okay, the data set was from a sample, okay, if it was from a sample, then the standard deviation, okay, uh, will be equal to the square root, okay, we say that uh, the variance from the sample, okay, and the sum from the first data set or the end data set of the deviation, I, I, okay, squared, uh, n minus one, okay. That is from, in case the sample, okay. In case the population, the same process is going to follow. Okay, that's the salvation therefore, will be equal to the square root, okay, of the sum of division, okay, for the, for, from the first data set, all the way to the nth data set, okay, of I, I, Okay, squared, this is a population, therefore we divide by n. And that's how we do get uh, the, define this well, this is how we do get, therefore, uh, the well, standard deviation uh, of the population. Okay, in case you're dealing with, okay, this is just said from probability distribution. Okay, probability distribution. Okay, therefore the variance, okay, uh, will be equal to the square root, okay, of some first data set to the end data set of probability, okay, uh, deviation squared i, i, okay, squared.
Okay, and that's how we do get the star deviation. Or simply the square root of the star, the square root of the variance. Okay, so depending in case in case for example you have already obtained uh, the variance, then simply get the star. Simply get therefore uh, the square root of the variance to obtain the standard deviation. Okay, to obtain the standard deviation. <clears throat> Okay, I hope it's, it's all clear. I hope it's all clear. Okay, that's standard vision as a measure of risk. Standard vision as a measure of risk. We can also measure risk, okay, uh, using um, other means, okay. So let me call this is C, so D. <clears throat> yeah. So that is on star division. D, <clears throat> the way of trying to measure risk is by the use of the covariance, by the use of what referred to as uh, the covariance. And covariance essentially <clears throat> it gives us okay we're trying to compare okay how do the return of two maybe stock or two assets okay vary with each other okay how do the return of two stock okay we can just try to define it okay covariance measures okay how the return Okay, measures uh, how the return of two assets move together or covalley. Okay, move together. We call the how the how do they covalley? Okay, how do they move together? Okay, that's what we refer to as. Uh, the sorry. that's what we refer to as the covariance. Okay, how do the return is a measure of how the return of if asset A increase, if the return from A is increasing, what is happening uh, to asset B? If asset B return are decreasing, what is happening to the return of asset B? Okay, so the covariance is measure of how that correlation of how that uh, relationship of the return of the different assets move together. Okay, we call the covariance. Okay, it's referred to as uh, the covariance. Okay, so for the sake of uh, rows, let's go back slightly. I think this is what Rose was asking for. Okay. That is what we refer to as the covariance, okay? Trying to see, okay? If A is increasing, if the return of A are increasing, what is happening to the return of B, okay? Uh, if B is decreasing, okay? What is happening to the return of A, okay? That's what we refer to as uh, the covariance, okay? We refer to as the covariance, okay? Trying to see uh, how is that movement, okay? How is that movement between A and B, okay? We refer to as the covariance. <clears throat> Okay, it's given us the covariance. Okay, uh, is given us. Let's say the covariance between, let's say, asset I and asset J. Okay, covariance. Okay. Uh, okay, covariance. Okay, between asset I and asset J. Okay, is given us. Okay, uh, the deviation. Okay, the deviation of I. The deviation of i from its mean, we multiply by the deviation of i of j from its mean. Okay, the deviation of j from its mean. Okay, because there are, because there are several data sets. Okay, of course we do need to get therefore uh, the sum from the first data set 
all the way to the nth data set, okay? Okay, from the first data set, okay? Uh, from where i is equal to one, okay? <clears throat> From the first data set, let me just call it from the first data set all the way to the nth data set. Okay. Okay, so if you can look in, okay, this is just like the formula of uh, the variance, okay. On the noise covariance, okay. There are two assets, not one asset, the two assets, okay. Of course, if it's, if the data set is from population, okay, if it's a sample, the same process follows, okay. If it's a sample, okay. Of course, it will be equal therefore, okay, the sum of deviation from the first data set, okay, to the end data set, okay, I, uh, I, okay, J, okay, minus the term, the mean term of J, okay, this is a sample, therefore, we divide by N minus one, okay, the sample, therefore, you divide by N minus one. <clears throat> That's in case it is, it is a sample, okay? That's in case it is a sample, okay? If it is a population, okay? Okay, if it is a population, okay, let me just draw here, okay? If we're trying to assess the covariance, okay, from population, then the covariance between I and J, okay? Let me just have a new paper new work area. <clears throat> okay, so that is from a sample, okay. If it is from a population, so we're trying to estimate the covariance, okay, of course to be equal to the sum of the deviation from the first set to the end of the set, okay. I, the mean return of I, we multiply by uh, j, the mean return of j, okay? Uh, we divide by n, and by extension, if it is from probability distribution, if it is from probability uh, distribution, then it will be equal to, the covariance will be equal to uh, the sum from the first data set with the end data set, okay? Probability return of i, the mean return of i, okay, multiply by uh, the return of j minus the mean return of j, okay. And that's how we do get, therefore, uh, the covariance, okay. That's how we do get, therefore, the covariance from a sample, from population, or set of population, or in case we're dealing with probability uh, distribution, okay. I hope it's all clear. <clears throat> if, for example, okay, from the result of the analysis, okay, we get a covariance of let's say a uh, thousand, okay, just an example. If we do get a covariance to be a thousand, okay, positive, okay, uh, then you can construe from it. You can be able to understand that if the return of A or I is increasing, then the return of uh, B is also increasing. To what extent you can't tell, but at least the figure is positive. Now, since you can't be able to tell by how many units, okay, uh, I is increasing, uh, if J is increasing, okay, let me just repeat that, okay. If, for example, we do get the outcome of your analysis, okay, that the covariance between I and J, <coughs> I and J is a thousand, okay. Now, what does a thousand mean, okay? Essentially, it might not have a lot of meaning. The only meaning you can be able to extract from it that it is a positive, okay. If it's a positive, then what does it mean? It means, therefore, if the return of I is increasing, then J is increasing. If the return of I is decreasing, then J is, J's returns are also decreasing, okay, because it's a positive. If it was a negative, okay, if it was a negative, okay, then it means, therefore, if the return of I are increasing, then for J, they are decreasing, okay, they're moving in opposite direction, okay, they're moving in the opposite direction. That's the only meaning. That's the only meaning you can able to get out of the covariance, okay? And that's why generally we do need to get a better measure, okay? Trying to if because you, you may want to understand, okay? Now if A increased by ten percent, what happened? What is the actual increase in B? From the covariance, you can't get that information, 
okay, for Mecovarians, you can't get that information. So we need to get another measure, okay, which we refer to as the coefficient of correlation. Okay, so the next measure of risk is called the coefficient of correlation. Okay, that's covariance. Okay? Now E, okay, we need to get what we call the coefficient of correlation. Okay, so E, so part E, okay, uh, a sort of fact was the coefficient of correlation. And the coefficient of correlation, okay, now we are trying to scale, okay, we are trying to scale uh, the covariance that you have just obtained, okay, so that it can have meaning, so that it can go to obtain the meanings out of those figures, okay, so we need to estimate for the coefficient of correlation, okay, and simply the coefficient of correlation, okay, try to scale, okay, in the attempt to scale the covariance, okay, let me just maybe define it, okay, okay. it scales, okay, it attempts. Okay, to put meaning, okay, uh, to put meaning, okay, to the covariance figures obtained. Okay, the scales, okay, the scales, uh, it's called the covariance, in quote, it scales the covariance of maybe the strength variation, the scales the strength of the relationship scales the strength of the musical co movement or relationship, co movement, okay, of the relationship, okay, between, okay, negative one and one, okay. So you're trying to scale uh, the relationship between one and negative one, okay? What does one mean? Okay, let me just make it, okay. For say one, let me just, one positive, let me just reinterpret here. Yeah. Let me just simple interpretation. Positive one, and it's all referred to as perfect, positive correlation okay well, maybe just to expound on it okay P positive one is called the perfect positive correlation okay and what does it mean okay okay it means it means that return of two stock of the two strokes increase maybe the return of two stroke this is not the term we can use here the return of the two stroke okay we call the word move okay the return of the two stroke move in the same direction By the same amount. Okay, they move in the same direction in the same amount. Okay, just to make it easy to understand. If a, if return of a increasing by, if return of a increase by 10%, if return of a increase by 10%, then return of B, then return of B, increase by the same amount, okay? Increase by 10%. If return of A decrease by 10%, B decrease by 10%. B is return, B is return, okay, decrease by 10%. Okay, so they move in the same direction. If one decrease, they are decrease. 
by how much the same amount okay that is the simple interpretation of what I mean by positive one okay it's called the perfect positive correlation okay of course in case we get a zero okay <clears throat> If we get a zero, okay, what does zero mean therefore? Okay, if we do get a zero, okay, in case we get a zero, okay, this is referred to as no correlation at all. No correlation of the asset returns. Of the asset set term. Okay, if we increase, then we can behave in a way. Okay, so the, the return of the two assets, they don't at all have any relationship. Okay, there's no correlation at all. Okay, not even by zero. Okay, if we get negative one, okay, if we get negative one, what is negative one? Okay, it's called the perfect negative correlation. Okay, it's called the perfect negative correlation. Okay, in case we get a negative one, we'll call the perfect negative correlation. What does that mean? Okay, uh, perfect negative correlation. It means, therefore, that the two assets, okay, they do move in the opposite direction. The return of the two assets, okay, they do move in opposite direction. Okay, it's fixed free. Okay, which means the return of the two assets, of the two assets. Okay, the returns of the two assets move in the opposite direction. Okay, in the opposite uh, direction. Okay, and by the same amount, and by the same amount, or by the same value. Let me just go by the same values. Okay, maybe just a g. If it is return is return increase by ten percent. Okay, then B is return. Okay, the, the A was increasing, so the B is will be decreasing. Okay, so B is return decrease by this amount. Okay, decrease by ten percent. Okay, uh, that is okay. If A is increasing, if A is decreasing, the vice versa. Okay, if A, if A is returns, okay, decrease now. This time when they're decreasing, okay, decrease by ten percent. Okay, uh, then B is return. Look, they're moving in opposite direction. Okay, so B is return increase this time around. Okay, and decrease by some amount. Okay, increase by ten percent okay that's what we mean by the coefficient okay of correlation okay the uh, the uh, uh, correlation coefficient okay between uh, those two figures okay <clears throat> between the two assets all the way from positive one to negative one okay don't forget the the co this coefficient of correlation okay uh, the, its need is coming up because for the case of uh, 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 covariance, okay, we can't scale it, okay. What does allows it mean, okay? You can't but know what allows it mean, okay. The only different, the only thing you can able to extract from it is it a positive, okay? It is a negative, okay? Therefore, you can be able to tell that uh, they are either moving negative or opposite direction. But from there, you can be able to tell, okay, uh, uh, what the exact interpretation of the covariance. Okay, and that's why we do need uh, what we refer to as the coefficient of correlation. Okay, hope it's all clear. Mm. Okay, so having understood the okay what the figures imply, okay. Now, how do you get therefore the coefficient of correlation? How do you get therefore uh, the coefficient of correlation? And it's given us okay. So your formula therefore. <clears throat> okay, the coefficient of correlation. Okay, the coefficient of correlation. Okay, uh, between. I and J, 
okay, is equal to, okay, between I and J is equal to the covariance, okay, between I and J, the covariance between I and J, we divide by the product of the individual asset, the product of the subdivision of the individual asset uh, between these two, okay, therefore, the variance, the standard deviation, sorry, okay, product of the standard deviation, the standard deviation of I, standard deviation of J. And that's how we get it for the coefficient of correlation. Just to define the terms here, okay, where, okay, this is the coefficient of correlation, okay, correlation coefficient, coefficient, Okay, between I and J, asset I and asset J. Okay, and of course this covariance. This is covariance of asset I of asset I and J. And of course this is standard deviation of standard deviation. Okay, of I, and this is standard deviation. Okay. So division of asset J. And that's how we get it for the coefficient of correlation uh, between those two figures. Clear? Question? From here, okay, you can be able to uh, maybe calculate the covariance, okay? Maybe just to, okay, just put. From the formulas we have obtained here, okay, we'll learn the one for correlation coefficients. We can be tell that the covariance between I and J, the covariance between asset I and asset J, I and J is equal to, okay, the coefficient correlation between I and J multiplied by the standard deviation of I standard deviation of J, okay, from this formula here. I've just made the covariance the sum to the equation. Okay, the covariance of I and J may seem like the product of the coefficient correlation between the two assets times the product of their individual standard deviation. Okay. Hope that's clear. Okay, seeing there's no question, I'm quite happy that it seems that you have understood that concept uh, very well. Okay. Seeing that you have understood it very well. Okay. Your class is exceptional, because most of the time, most students uh, shy away from these formulas, okay, but they don't have at all, okay. But seeing that your class is quite exceptional, seeing that you got it uh, the first time, that is very much commendable. <clears throat> so, where is look? Okay, <clears throat> welcome for our second session. So, we were discussing on how we do get risk, okay, uh, using the various possible ways, okay. So, we are discussing how we get risk using the various possible ways, okay. Now, I would want us, okay, we go through your examiner, okay, uh, we check on some of the concepts, okay, uh, that we have discussed, okay, uh, for that particular area, okay. And we do have this question, actually, okay. Uh, November 2019, okay, last year, city, November 2019, uh, question three, part B. November 2019, question three, part B, okay? So go through it, then we attend together. November 2019, uh, part three B.
Okay, I presuppose that you have gone through the question. So part one is asking you, okay, to get the star deviation of y and z. Okay, part two, uh, to get the relative risk of y and z. And part three, you advise the investor on which of the two assets they ought to take. Okay. So here, to get in part A, we're simply targeting the salivation. And from the, data, from the data set we have above here, look, this is probability distribution, okay? Therefore, we can say, we can begin with Y, okay? Star division of Y, okay? So it's answering Y, okay? So therefore, standard deviation, okay? For Y, okay, so we can begin have, this is probability, okay? Then I can have here the return, the focus return. Okay, let me call them R. Okay, probability, the first one is 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.35, uh, 0 0.05. Okay, 0 0.05. Uh, we have 0 0.15. We have 0 0.15. Okay, then the return. Okay, the first outcome is 10%. Okay, 12%, uh, 8%, 15, uh, 14 and nine, and 9, okay? So, because the first thing we need to get is to get the mean return, okay? The first thing we need to get is to get the mean return. So, probability multiplied by uh, the return. So, probability multiplied by the return, okay? The first thing, so 0 0.1 times 10 and get 1, uh, 0 0.24, or 2.4, I don't know. The simple multiplying probability times uh, the return. Okay, probability times the return. <clears throat> so do that from the first outcome all the way to the last outcome. And the sum total will give us, therefore, the mean return for asset, asset Y. And how do you get the mean return for asset Y? Okay, so you do from the first outcome all the way to the last outcome. Okay, so got 10.4, okay, so the sum is equal to 10.4. Okay, having obtained the sum, okay, that is the main return for uh, R, for Y. For Y, then of course now is to get uh, the probability, the next is probability multiplied by the return deviation squared. We need to square now this deviation, okay. The probability for the first outcome was 0 0.1, okay, 0 0.1 multiply by the return is 10, so 10 uh, minus the mean, okay, 10.4, 10.4 squared, okay. The second outcome, the probability is 0 0.2, so 0 0.2, uh, the return is 12 minus the mean return, 10.4, okay, squared. The next one is 0 0.35, the return is 8 minus the mean return, 10.4, squared, okay. Okay, we do the same for the next one, 0 0.05 probability, return is 15, mean is 10.4, okay, squared. Okay, 0 0.15 probability, return 14, minus the mean return, 10.4, okay, squared. And the last one, 0 0.15, return is nine, minus the mean, 10.4, squared, okay. And now we get uh, the sum. For the sum, therefore, okay, so the sum is equal to 5.84, okay, 5.84, okay, that's why I skipped it uh, from most of you, okay, so you get the sum, therefore, the uh, variance, okay, to be equal to 5.84. The question is asking us to get uh, the standard deviation, okay, it's asking us to get, therefore, the standard deviation, okay, therefore. Standard deviation. Okay, we say it is the square root of the variance. Okay, square root of the variance. Would you go to the square root of 5.84 percent squared? What do you get? Be the standard deviation, therefore. 2 points. 2.2.42 percent. Okay. 2.42 percent uh, become therefore the standard deviation for this stock. Okay, 2.24, 2.42 percent.
Clear. I hope it's uh, clear to all of you. Okay, that is four. Why? Don't forget you have Z to go. Okay, don't forget you also have the Z. Okay, and we repeat the same process. Okay, we repeat the same process when it comes to getting the star division uh, for Z. Okay. Okay. So. Okay. Now this is that was for Y. Okay. Now Z. Okay. Okay, for Z now, okay, same process. Uh, we have return, okay, we have probability, okay, the same process. Uh, actually, to avoid a lot of markings, I guess I can use this. Let me just use this table, okay, for our analysis. So this is, I'll tell you, this is for X, this for Y, okay, and this is now for Z. Okay, probability remain as 0 0.1 for the outcome, okay. Uh, so here you're going to have probability times return. Okay, now this is for Z, not for Y. Okay, so 0 0.1. Okay, times the outcome is eight. Okay, uh, uh, zero out uh, probability is 0 0.2. Outcome here is equal to 10. Okay, so you do that for the first outcome or three to the last outcome. Okay, and that will be there for the mean return. Okay, and we get the sum here. Okay, we get the sum here. Okay. So we get the sum here. Okay, and that's again be the mean return for Z. Okay. Once we've done that, okay, we want to get the variance. Okay, so probability multiplied by the return minus the mean return. Okay, squared. We already have the mean return here from our analysis here. Okay. So we do for the first outcome, okay, 0 0.1, outcome is 8, minus the mean you've just obtained, okay, squared, for the first outcome, all three to the last outcome here. And this is going to give us the variance for Z. Okay, can you do that? Okay. Okay. Yes, David. You, if that's that, that's the case. That that's how we are, we are dealing with it. For sure, it is. Okay. So R is a return, and R noted is all um, annotated uh, is the mean return or the return expected. The mean is same as the return expected. Yes. That's 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 how it should be. And that's what we are doing here. We are, we are doing here. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, please suppose that the mean return for Z from the calculation uh, is 8.7. So 8.7 is the mean return. And the variance okay, of Z is, is it 1.68? I'm not sure I will last television. What the sum here? Is it 1.68? 2.81. Okay, so the variance is 2.81. Okay. We can play the four. Okay, so I suppose that with all those figures, okay, okay, which is suppose therefore, uh, therefore the star division, okay, the star division for Z, okay, star division, okay, for uh, Z therefore will be the square root of the variance, okay, square root of two point eight one, okay, and we get the return to be. Uh, one point, you got, so you got in one point something. 1.68, you got 1.68, okay, percent, okay. 1.6 percent, therefore, to be the star division for Z, okay. This was for Y, okay, and this is for Z, okay. Okay, and that's how simply we do determine uh, the star division uh, for the two stock, okay. That is for Y and for Z, okay. Roman 2, okay, is asking us the relative risk of Y and of Z, okay. 
No, actually, there's um, another risk mission, okay, that I should have given to you, okay? So let's actually discuss the next one, okay, the next risk mission. Uh, we were discussing the last one was E, which was coefficient of correlation, okay? Now, the next one is called, uh, the next we can use, uh, the next one we can use uh, to assess the risk of the risk of uh, a stock. Okay, okay. Now this means okay. Now for the case of Roman two, okay. As you can see, okay, for the sake of Roman two, if you observe the return, okay, the return for Z, okay, let me just the mean return for Z was equal to ten point four, okay. The key it is okay. The mean return for Z is 10.4. The mean return for that's for sorry for Y. The mean return for uh, uh, the mean return for Z is 8.7. The risk for Y, okay, as measured by division is 2.42. Okay, and for Z is 1.68. Now, which one do we take? Okay. If you observe, okay, that Y has higher return, higher risk. Z has lower risk, lower return. So which one do you take, for example, okay? So you need another uh, measure, okay, that can help you out in, in being able to make a decision as which of the two you ought to be taking, okay? So the next measure of risk you're going to use is called the coefficient of variation, okay? So that you can go to answer uh, Roman 2 and Roman 3. So F, Okay, so this is E was on coefficient, coefficient correlation. Okay, so the next one is coefficient of variation. Okay, so here you can have what we call the coefficient. So F, okay, the coefficient, okay, coefficient of variation as another risk measure. Okay, now the coefficient probably of variation essentially okay uh we are trying to determine okay uh for every unit of uh return okay that you're going to receive from that particular investment for every unit of return we are receiving from the investment okay how much uh, uh risk okay did it come with okay so okay for every unit of uh uh risk for every unit of return, okay, for every return uh, unit, okay, how much risk does it expose the holder to, okay? So you're using, using the same basis, return, okay? If we're going to have 1% return, how much risk does the, that 1% return comes with, okay? So it's more or less a, a risk per return unit, okay? Risk per return unit, okay? That's referred to as the coefficient of variation. So let me just to maybe define or make a comment on it, okay? Okay, it is the total risk of an asset, okay, per unit of return, per unit of return of that, as, of that investment or that asset, okay? Simply, uh, it's the total risk, okay? Or simply, it is for every return unit we receive, okay? How much risk does that 1% of return, or one share of return comes with, okay? Generally, okay, it is calculated, okay, it is calculated, okay, uh, by dividing, by dividing, <coughs> by dividing the total risk, by doing total risk, okay, dividing uh, total risk with the total return of the project, okay? Total risk by its total return over that time period, okay? Over that time period, okay? It's quite an easy one, okay, actually. Okay, so you can see the coefficient okay, of variation. Okay, we just want to extract the formula. Okay, is they are giving us okay uh, 
total risk. Okay, we divide by total return. Okay, total risk is measured by star deviation. Okay, so star deviation, we divide by the mean return. Okay, simple as that. Okay, so we simply total risk, we divide by total return. Okay, that's how we do measure the coefficient of variation. The coefficient of variation. Total risk, we divide by total return, or the mean, this, uh, mean return. Okay. <clears throat> Maybe this sum can be confusing. Let me remove it. Okay, so simply it's a risk. Okay, we divide by a return. Okay, the main return. Okay, so we have the formula. Now I think we can apply it on our question here. Okay, because the two assets, okay, there's no uh, clear cut decision you can make. Okay, because as you can see, okay, so just going back to our question here. Okay, as you can see, the return for y, okay. The return for R, okay, is 10 points per 10.4. This is a risk, okay. And the return for R is higher than the return for Z, but it has higher risk. The return for Z is 8.7, it's lower, but it has lower risk, okay. Don't forget, okay, assuming, okay, I think we mentioned in CAPEM that the investor is assumed to be risk averse, okay. The investor is assumed to be risk averse. What does it imply? It may imply, therefore, they need to, or they make decision, okay? They make decision based on the amount of risk, okay? They make decision based on the risk and return, okay? okay? Let me just define that term here, okay? Okay. Maybe in capital market, in capital market theory, the value is CAPM, okay? In capital, okay, market theory, Okay, investors as are assumed, investors are assumed okay, to be risk averse. Okay, that is. Okay. Even if an asset, okay, that is. Even asset. Yields. If two assets, if two assets, let me just. If two assets, if two assets yield the same return, yields the same return. Okay, then he will consider. He or she will consider. The assets with lower risk, the assets that pairs with lower risk, with lower risk. Okay. Okay, that is one. Okay, and two. If two assets have the same have the same level of risk. He will consider. He will consider the assets that have higher return. That is, they have the same risk. And three. If if one and two cannot be used, if one if one and two okay, cannot be applied, okay, then the investor, by one I mean what you have one here, what you have two here, okay, then the investor, okay, we have to consider, we have to consider The risk exposure, the risk exposure for every unit of of return received. In short, the coefficient of variation. What do you mean here? The coefficient of variation. Okay. 
<clears throat> that's as far the capital market theory, okay? So the investor you have to consider as to whether they are receiving uh, return, okay, commensurate, okay, uh, to the risk they are exposed to, okay? So let's apply this now to our case here, okay, to our example here, okay? So let's apply this uh, to our example here. Okay, so having done, okay, having discussed the uh, risk averseness, okay, of the investor, okay, now let's apply the coefficient of variation, determine the coefficient of variation for each of our two stocks here, okay? So coefficient of variation. Okay, you can begin with Y, this is Y. Yeah, this is why, okay, so we can begin with why, okay, for why, it is going to be the risk, and the risk, we have, we have it here, okay, 2.42, we divide by the return, and the return, we have, the return for why was how much, for why was 10.4, we divide by 10.4, okay, that gives the coefficient of valuation for why, the same thing apply, okay, we have the same working, okay, uh, for Z, Okay, be the risk 1.68. We divide by the return for Z, okay, which you have 8.7. Okay, then you get how much for Y and Z? Zero point. <clears throat> Okay, so my board is not so clear. Anyway, I'll, I'll try to expand it, okay? Let's finish here, okay? So, a Montana, for why you get 0 0.23, okay? For Z, what do you get? Okay, for Z, 0 0.19, 0 0.19, okay? That is for Y and that is for Z. So next, okay, just try to interpret, okay, trying to interpret uh, uh, our analysis. And therefore, if you invest in Y, if we do invest in Y, it means for every return you'll be receiving, you are exposed to 0 0.23, okay, yeah. unit of risk, okay, or can be percent, whatever it is. For Z, for every return you receive, okay, for every 1% of return, the exposure of risk is 0.19 percent now which one do you accept of course the one you have the lowest risk exposure in this case would you accept z therefore okay why because for the same return one percent for why the exposure towards the risk is 0 0.23 for z is 0 0.19 then of course you accept z therefore we have lower risk exposure for the same return unit Okay, and that's answers Roman three. Okay, that's ground for our answer to Roman three. Okay, simple as that. Okay, that's how we do apply the concept. Okay, <clears throat> Amolo and Mosotti. I hope my board is clear now. Maybe just confirm as true. You can see it. Masoti. Yes. You can see my board now. Is it clear? No, no, it's not clear. Wow. No. How do I make it even now? Uh, it's not. Wow. Hmm. Let me assume that the video, the recording can capture it very well because otherwise I, I'm not sure because th I think there's a maximum I can go to uh, to to zoom.
Okay, and I think that can mark the head of a class. Okay, if there is no question, okay, that can mark uh, the head of our class. Okay, let's use some maybe uh, the one or two area. Okay, which we need to discuss on the risk. Okay, I don't think uh, uh, next week once we meet, we shall attempt to finish on this topic. Okay, so we're to end the class. Don't forget you need to.